One of my favorite things about the Harry Potter series is how J.K. Rowling created a full-fledged wizarding lexicon. The things these words describe are fantastical, but the words themselves seem real. When I say the words seem real, here's what I mean. There are a number of magical creatures that are real in the books. Then there are a few creatures that are considered real only by Harry's school friend Luna Lovegood and her dad Xenophilius Lovegood, who believe in all sorts of wacky conspiracy theories. I mean, they're basically the wizarding version of flat earthers. So the factual magical creatures' names are supposed to sound real, while Luna's creatures are supposed to sound imagined. Now, see if you can tell which of these are which. Whether or not you remember the books well, you should be able to tell the difference. Okay, so these are Luna's creatures. Did you get it right? Luna's creatures are just phonetically weird. Can you think of a single English word that ends in cack? These words sound made up, and that's intentional. But the rest of Rowling's magical words sound like they could be real words, and I think this is super important, because it's a key part of what makes the wizarding world Rowling created seem so close to ours and so real. The first and most common technique Rowling uses is creating new words with Latin or Greek roots. This is especially true for spells. Oculus Reparo. Deriving the spells from Latin gives them the gravitas and mystery of an ancient language while at the same time making them a lot easier to understand. Even if you don't know Latin, it's easy to figure out the meaning of each spell from the shared roots they have with English words. Over half of all English words have Latin or Greek roots, but in technical and scientific vocabularies, it's over 90%. And spells are basically magical science, so it makes even more sense that there's a lot of Latin involved. Many of Rowling's neologisms are created by blending or combining English or foreign words, and these words are never chosen at random. Gringotts, the goblin-run bank storing wizard gold, contains ingot, which is a slab of gold. Dementors, fiends that suck the happiness out of people, often leaving them mad. We get demented and tormentor. Thestrals are carnivorous winged horses only visible to those who have seen someone die. And the word sounds like spectral and like kestrel. By the way, I had no idea what a kestrel was, but it turns out it's a small bird of prey. The pensive, a magical instrument for storing and viewing memories. We get pensive and sieve. And maybe my favorite invention of all, Aragog, the rather evil king of the giant acromantula spiders who has eight huge eyes. We get demagog, arachnid, and agog. Can we panic now? All of these words match the things they signify perfectly. They sound right, they evoke the right associations. Another way Rowling anchors her magical lexicon squarely in reality is by using existing words but extending their meaning. In English, a damp squib is a firework that doesn't go off. But in the wizarding world, squibs are children born to wizarding parents who have no magical powers. Magical duds of sorts. And many of the creatures that some readers thought were Rowling's inventions, hippogriffs, grindylows, hinkypunks, vela, boggarts, actually come from ancient lore. Rowling researched these forgotten creatures and made them her own. If not using any existing roots or words, Rowling makes sure that the words still have fitting associations. Azkaban, the wizard prison, sounds like Alcatraz. Durmstrang, the wizarding school based in northern Europe and focused on the dark arts, sounds like Sturm und Drang, a borrowed German expression that translates roughly as turmoil and stress. Sickles, silver wizarding coins, evoke a silver sickle moon, but also sound like the Yiddish word shekels or even simple nickels. Even the words that don't carry much associative meaning still sound organic. And to me, super British, unlike Luna's rack spurts and snorkaks. It's easy to imagine that all these words are part of an organic branch of English that split off from our muggle tongue centuries ago and developed parallel to ours. And the wizarding lexicon is made all the more believable by how comprehensive it is. We get a wizarding twist on every type of word and expression there is. There's wizard marketing lingo, quick spell, skelegro, quick quotes quill, catchy titles, basic hexes for the busy and vexed, saucy tricks for tricky sorts, print media brands, the daily prophet, the quibbler, transfiguration today, a scientific journal in which Dumbledore was published at a very young age, and even expletives, Merlin's pants, galloping gargoyles, and many idioms and proverbs. Hold your hippogriffs. Time is galleons. Don't count your owls before they are delivered. It's no good crying over spilt potion. The fire is lit, but the cauldron's empty. That's my favorite. It means that someone's a bit batty. 
Each new word Rowling invents seems both familiar and foreign, a magical play on the ordinary. Sometimes we get overt wordplay. Number 12, Grim Old Place, is literally a grim old place. Dark Arts Repository Nocturne Alley sounds like nocturnally, and Diagon Alley, of course, is diagonally. But these winks at the reader, rather than breaking the spell, work with the whimsical logic of the wizarding world. The thing is, Rowling's magical terms are firmly rooted in the rules governing the way new words are created in English. They lean heavily on Latin and Greek roots, borrow from foreign languages, broaden or reinvent the meaning of existing words and blend words together. But at the same time, they're still kooky, playful, weird, and enchanting. As a result, the wizarding world seems all the more close to ours. Just like Diagon Alley, which can be found if you know where to look, right in the middle of Muggle London, the wizarding language is only a playful twist away from our own. There's where you get your quills and your ink. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. As a bonus, I'm including a bunch of names of historical figures from the tapestries and statues of Hogwarts. I couldn't resist collecting them. I mean, Ethelred the Ever Ready. <laughs> Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly enjoyed making it. If you did like it, it would be a huge help to me if you shared it somewhere. Thanks for watching and see you soon.